Hello, this is Professor Keen. Welcome back to my lectures on electricity, magnetism, and light, where we are looking at the work of Michael Faraday, his experimental researches in electricity. These were published in 1831. Remember in my last lecture, we began looking at page 301 in A Student's Guide to the Great Physics Texts. On this page, what Faraday is doing is he's laying out what he is going to be talking about. And his motivation was as follows, you might recall. He reasoned this way. Well, we know already that when one passes an electrical current through a wire, the compass needle placed nearby will be deflected. That's something that Ersted had discovered some time back in 1820, I believe. So electrical currents produce magnetic effects. This naturally raises the question in Faraday's mind, can magnets be used to generate electricity? And at the bottom of page 301, he says, yes, I was able to do that. I was able to take a simple magnet and generate an electrical current using that. Now remember up until this point, electrical currents had really been generated primarily chemically. So you have a chemical or a voltaic cell where the chemical reactions uh, take place in such a way as to drive an electrical current through a wire. People were very familiar with this. But what Faraday is saying, there's another way of generating electrical current, it's using magnets. And now what he's going to do is go on to explain how he was able to succeed in this endeavor. So let's move on to page 302. And it's kind of nice here, what Faraday does is he gives a detailed explanation of experimental apparatus, both the ones that failed and the ones that succeeded. So he begins, first of all, by talking in point six. He takes some copper wire, he gives the dimensions of it, and he wraps this copper wire around a wooden cylinder in the form of a helix. And he also takes another coil of cop uh, copper wire, and he also wraps this around the helix. But he makes it so that these two coils do not actually make electrical contact with one another. So let me draw it in this way. Suppose we have a wooden, uh, a wooden dowel of some sort, like this. And this is going to schematically represent what he's doing. And let's suppose we take this copper wire and we wrap it around the helix, like this. And he gives the exact number of turns he uses and the exact number of feet of wire he uses. And he does this. And then he says he hooks these up to a galvanometer. Uh, and a galvanometer, remember, is basically um, a compass needle suspended near a wire. It's, or you can do it in a more sophisticated way, but the idea is to have a device that measures the presence of electrical current. And so I'll just draw a box and call this a galvanometer. And the idea is that he has this set of copper wires wrapped around the wooden dowel hooked up to a galvanometer. And then he has another set of copper wires that are also wrapped around this helical coil. And I don't remember which way he wraps them, but I'm just going to make them looking like they're going this way. So this is another set of copper wires. And importantly, he spaces these from each other using a string or a twine so that they will not be in electrical contact with one another. And he actually wraps these around in several layers and he puts some, I think he says, paper in between them or calico or something like that. And um, epoxy kind of makes this, this interwoven series of coils that weave in and out of one another. So he says in point seven, one of these helices was connected to a galvanometer, which is what I've shown, and the other set of coils with a voltaic battery. And he gives the strength of it, he says 10 plates that are four square inches with double coppers and well charged. So um, remember the idea here is that you can just take a, a trough like this and you can put some kind of acid in it or brine in it and I'll draw kind of this liquid in it like this and then he takes these copper plates and he immerses these copper and zinc plates in it to make a voltaic cell. We talked a little bit about this before. I'm not going to try to draw, um, draw it in great detail. But the idea is that by hooking up these wires to the opposite ends, the copper and the zinc ends, one can then turn on the electrical current that is passing through one of the coils. So the idea is if, let's suppose, this was the positive terminal and this was the negative terminal of this um, 
he calls it a um, voltaic battery. So the voltaic battery. One can drive an electrical current, and we're using Ampere's convention for electrical current, through this primary coil. And what he's trying to do is he's trying to see if an electrical current can be generated in the secondary coil. So the red one we would call the primary coil. And you're using a voltaic battery to drive current through the primary coil. And the secondary coil is in this diagram, the orange one. It's the other set of wires that is hooked up to the galvanometer. And he's going to see if it's possible to generate an electrical current in the secondary by driving an electrical current through the primary. And he says that he was unable to do so. He says at the end, yet not the slightest sensible deflection of the galvanometer needle could be observed. So he failed. And then what he does, he says, I go on to con conduct um, a similar compound helix consisting of six lengths of copper and six of soft iron wire was constructed. He uses more wire, he wraps it around again, and he says no effect upon the other, the secondary coil, could be perceived at the galvanometer. And he says in these and many other similar experiments, no difference in action of any kind appeared between iron and other metals. So presumably he used different wires, copper, um, perhaps gold, iron, different kinds of wire. He was not able to detect any current in the secondary coil. And then in point 10, he experiences success. He uses a much more powerful battery that uses 100 plates that are four square inches in his voltaic battery. So a much more powerful battery. And he uses, I think, a little bit longer wire, I believe. Uh, he gives the details and he says, when it, the contact was made, that is the contact between the primary coil and the voltaic battery, so he touches the wires to the battery. When contact was made, there was a sudden and very slight effect at the galvanometer, and there was a similar slight effect when the contact with the battery was broken. So this was the first successful situation. So his success was in point 10, was that a slight deflection of the galvanometer was observed at the moment of contact of contact and the moment of disconnection of disconnection of the primary coil to the battery. Okay, so it was a very momentary kind of effect. It wasn't a sustained effect. And he says, but whilst the voltaic battery was continuing to pass through the one helix, no galvanometrical appearances of any effect like induction upon the other helix could be perceived, although the active power of the battery was proved to be great by its heating of the whole of its own helix and by the brilliancy of the discharge when made through charcoal. So what is he saying here? He's saying when he makes contact with the primary coil, he turns it on, there's a sudden deflection of the galvanometer. But then even when you keep the contact made, so a current continues through the primary coil, the effect dies away in the galvanometer. There's no more current flowing in the secondary coil, even though current continues to flow in the primary coil. How does he know it continues to flow in the primary? Well, the wire in the primary becomes red hot. It gets very warm, so that's an indication that there is current in the primary coil. And then he goes on to talk about some more experiments that he did. And one of the also interesting things he does is he replaces the galvanometer with another coil. This is in section 12. He replaces the galvanometer with another coil, and he inserts a needle in that other coil. I guess this is in, I guess, experiment 13. He finds that the needle becomes magnetized. So let me make a quick sketch of this. So it's the same situation as before. So I'll draw once again this, and I'll draw the primary coil hooked up to the battery. And I'm just going to draw schematically a battery here. Once again, with a couple of terminals. And let's make like a little switch so that we can turn it on and off by connecting it or disconnecting it. And then the secondary coil wrapped around here once again. 
And then here, what he's doing, you might imagine that he's taking a, like a test tube of some sort, a glass tube, and he's wrapping this around here. And then he inserts a needle, an iron needle into this. And when he turns on the primary coil and turns it off, um, he's trying to see if that needle becomes magnetized. So he notices that if you put the needle in and then you turn on the electrical current in the primary and then you pull the needle out, the needle has become magnetized. And that's a signature of the fact that there must have been a current generated in the secondary coil. And you'll remember when a current is generated in the secondary coil, it creates a magnetic field which magnetizes the iron. And then he does a number of other experiments where he alternates opening and closing the primary and seeing if the needle is magnetized or not. But essentially what he's trying to do is determine um, whether or not and how big the electrical current is that's flowing in the secondary coil. Okay, so that's the second set of experiments that he does. Another experiment that he does is instead of using a primary and secondary coil, he uses another setup that is described in number 18. And again, I'm just kind of pointing, pointing you to some of the highlights of, of Faraday's experimental researches. In point 18, now what he does is he takes a board and he, I'll draw a board like this. He takes this board and he nails wire to it in the shape of a, I think a W is what he says. He says, um, several feet of copper wire were stretched in wide zigzag forms representing the letter W on one surface of the broad board. A second wire was stretched in precisely similar forms on a second board so that when brought near the first, the wire should everywhere touch except that a sheet of thick paper was interposed. So he shaped he put wire, maybe he had some nails sticking out of this board and he wrapped the wire around the nails. Of course, he probably had to insulate these wires because he couldn't go down to you know, Ace Hardware and pick up a Teflon insulated copper wire. He had to actually do the insulation himself. So he, he had these nails sticking out of this board that he would wrap this wire around into this particular shape. And he's gonna go on to say that this one he hooks up to a galvanometer to measure electrical current flowing in this. And then he takes another board, I'll draw this one down here, that is the same size and shape. And he stretches this, another W-shaped wire on this so that if they were to touch, they would be perfectly overlapping with one another. And then I guess maybe he, he puts one on the bottom side and one on the top side because he says that he has to put a sheet of paper between them like this so that they don't touch when you bring them near to one another. And then he says, if I remember correctly, I think one of them, the bottom one, he attaches to a voltaic battery. So the first wire, uh, if I look at the bottom of page 303, he says one of these wires was connected with a galvanometer and the other with a voltaic battery. So let me draw a battery right here. With a couple of terminals, a positive and a negative terminal. And these wires he hooks up to right here and right here. And then what he does is he makes one of these boards approach the other one. So he it undergoes motion toward or away from the second W. So you might think of this, the bottom one as being kind of like acting like the primary in his first set of experiments and the second W acting kind of like the secondary. And what does he notice? He says, when he did this, the first wire was then moved toward the second and as it approached, the needle was deflected. The galvanometer needle was deflected, being then removed when you move the board away, the needle was deflected in the opposite direction by first making the wires approach and then recede simultaneous with the vibrations of the needle, the latter soon become very extensive. But when the wires ceased to move from or towards each other, the galvanometer needle soon came to its usual position. 
So in other words, when he moves one of the boards toward the other, you get a galvanometer deflection in one way, and when you move it away, you get a galvanometer detect deflection in the other way. And by moving them back and forth, kind of shaking them at just the right frequency, you can get this needle to swing back and forth and become larger and larger and larger. You're kind of hitting a resonance sort of phenomenon. And he says as soon as you stop moving one of these boards, then the, the deflection of the galvanometer needle goes away. Okay, so he's he's kind of building up a battery of these experiments that illustrate the induction of electrical current by nearby electrical currents. He hasn't yet demonstrated that it is done by magnetism yet. All he's done so far is demonstrate that a current in one coil or circuit can generate an electrical current in another coil or circuit when there is some motion, either either motion or turning on and off the current in the primary coil.